When I took my first trip to Japan, my wife and I spent several nights in Kyoto and the Ryokan in Fushimi. As we walked around, I noticed that the town was a virtual monument to a single samurai. The town is host to a full one kilometer trail dedicated to him, indicating notable places the samurai stayed, where he fell in love, and even where he was almost murdered. The samurai's name is Sakamoto Ryoma, and I quickly discovered that he was one of the driving forces behind the fall of the shogunate and the rise of the new Japan. I also discovered that when you change the world, you make a slew of enemies. Ryoma's life ended at age 31, but his legacy continues to inspire people well into the modern era. Before discussing Ryoma's life, it's important to understand the world into which Ryoma was born. For two centuries, since Tokugawa Ieyasu won the Battle of Sekigahara, the Tokugawa family ruled Japan. The Tokugawa shogun sat at the top of the power structure as the ruler of the bakufu, or warrior government, with Japan's emperor reduced to symbolic status. Underneath the Tokugawa family were the daimyo, the provincial feudal rulers of the country. A select few daimyo were steadfastly loyal to the shogunate, often due to blood relations, but others, the hereditary vassals or tozama daimyo. Served under the shogun in a marriage of convenience, the daimyo represented a constant potential threat to the shogun's power, as any of them could grow powerful enough to eventually overthrow the central government. The shogunate responded to this threat through several means. One was a system called sankin kotai. A daimyo and his family were forced to live near the shogun in the capital of Edo every two years. On the in-between years, they were allowed to return home, but their wives and children had to remain behind. This hostage-taking system had the dual effect of keeping the daimyo's loved ones under constant threat of dismemberment, while also financially draining the daimyo by forcing them to maintain two household estates. Between this and the Tetsudai Fushin, a set of public works projects imposed on the daimyo that also drained local coffers. The Tokugawa family was able to keep these subordinate rulers in line, along with its plentiful income streams and its skillful placation of the farming community. The Tokugawa family pulled off a remarkable feat: over 250 years of mostly peaceful, uninterrupted rule of a united Japan. The result was a cultural explosion that gifted us with many of the cultural arts that are considered today as uniquely Japanese, including kabuki. Woodblock printing and sushi, among others. Japan's agricultural economy thrived, and its population nearly doubled. But no ride lasts forever, and eventually the Bakumatsu, or end of the samurai government, came to dawn. The crack started in the early 19th century, around the time of the fifth Tokugawa shogun, Tokugawa Tsunayoshi. The long period of peace in Japan allowed commerce to prosper. Which, ironically, undermined the feudal farming-centric economic model upon which the regime relied. As the number of farmers who fell into poverty increased, so did the number of local protests and rebellions. This increasing discontent didn't go unnoticed by two of the largest clans in Japan: the Satsuma clan, located in the south in Kagoshima, and the Choshu clan, at the southernmost end of the main island of Honshu. With the rise of commerce, Satsuma in particular began to shine, building ironworks and Western-style factories, further enriching its own coffers. Choshu's own growth and ambitions found it at odds with the shogunate, until in the 1860s, the two sides actively went to war against one another. In short, the mid-1800s were a time of increasing instability. Sakamoto Ryoma ended up being a man well suited. To such turbulent times, Sakamoto Ryoma was born in 1835, the sixth year of the Tempo Imperial Era, to a low-ranking samurai family in the Tosa clan in modern-day Kochi Prefecture on the southern island of Shikoku. Legends about the childhood of Ryoma tell of a kid you wouldn't expect to become a samurai. Reputably a terrible student, Ryoma dropped out of school 
after which he was educated primarily by his sister, Otome, who herself excelled at various arts, including swordsmanship, archery, and swimming. Ryoma found himself particularly adept at swordsmanship, and improving his skills became something of an obsession. In 1853, enthralled with the discipline, Ryoma moved to the capital of Edo, where he studied the Hokushin Ito style of swordsmanship under Chiba Sadakichi. Hokushin Ito is often described as a logical reworking of other schools of swordsmanship that compress those traditions complex nine levels of progress down to three, and reduced the time required to clear the system from a grueling ten years down to a mere five. Just two months after Ryoma landed in Edo, Japan's world changed forever. On June 3rd, the first of Commodore Matthew Perry's ships landed in Uraga Bay, an event known as the Arrival of the Black Boats, or Kurobune Raiko. Perry brought a simple message to Japan's leaders. Open your borders to trade with the U.S. and other Western nations, or we'll open them for you. Up until that time, Japan is said to have had an isolationist policy, or sakoku. Some thinkers, however, such as Aizawa Osamu, say this term is misleading. Japan wasn't cut off from the world. Rather, the Tokugawa regime funneled all contact and trade through four points of entry, such as the island known as Dejima off of the coast of Nagasaki, and limited their trading contacts primarily with the Dutch. The Shogun received a regular report directly from Dutch traders keeping them abreast of the major events in the world. The Tokugawa government's goal wasn't to isolate itself, but to control the flow of goods and information throughout the country. This approach also allowed the Tokugawa government to prevent Christian missionaries from gaining a foothold in Japan. While this strategy was successful for well over a hundred years, Perry's arrival threw the country into chaos. Government officials and samurai scholars fiercely debated how to respond. While many sympathized with the desire to repel the invaders, it was apparent to most level-headed thinkers that the primarily agrarian economy of the Tokugawa Bakufu couldn't respond forcefully to Perry's demand for open trade. The Western powers were just too heavily armed. A new movement began. Son no Joi, revere the emperor and expel the barbarians. A movement which argued that the emperor should be returned to his rightful place as a sovereign leader of the nation, and the country should muster its armed forces and chase out the foreigners. Perry gave the Tokugawa government a year to respond to the U.S. president's request. A year passed, however, and the Tokugawa regime had no effective response. The government was left no choice but to sign the Convention of Kanagawa, the Nichibei Washinjoyaku, a peace treaty with very favorable terms for the U.S. It then later signed a larger peace treaty with most of the larger Western powers. The move angered Japan's warrior class and undermined the Tokugawa government's legitimacy in the eyes of many. One of the primary parties to the treaty, I Naosuke, was vilified throughout the country, leading him to instigate a roundup in 1858 of many associated with the Sonno Joey movement. Two years later, Naosuke was assassinated. After over 250 years of relative peace, Japan was entering into a dangerous and turbulent battle for the soul of the nation. The arrival of the black boats only seems to have fueled the Duoma's desire to double down on his studies. The world was changing, but he still had a lot to learn. He entered the school of the intellectual warrior Sakuma Shouzan, where he studied gunnery, sonology, and Dutch, as the Netherlands were Japan's primary trading and communications partner under the isolationist policy of the Tokugawa regime. Ryoma took a break from his studies in 1855 upon the death of his father, Hachihei, but returned to Edo in 1856 and resumed his learning. Ryoma also became actively involved in the debates about the foreigners. The daimyo of the major clans began communicating amongst themselves about the best way to respond to the arrival of the U.S. We know from letters that Ryoma sent his father that Ryoma himself was a believer in the repel the barbarians rhetoric. At the same time, however, Ryoma made contact with others who had knowledge of the world outside of Japan. Such figures included John Manjido, a former fisherman from Ryoma's Tosa clan who made his way to America after being shipwrecked on a deserted island. 
These new friends spun stories about what they had seen abroad, opening up Adilma's eyes to the wider world and deepening his thinking. Particularly, they impressed upon Neoma the huge difference in commerce that separated countries like the U.S. and Britain from Japan. Neoma returned to Tosa where his close friend Takeichi Suizan, also known as Takeichi Hampeta, was working to build a movement that brought Japan's clans together in resistance against the foreigners. Both Takeichi and Neoma became part of an organization in Tosa called the Tosa Kinoto, or the Tosa Imperial Loyalist Party which aimed to make the ideals of the Sonno Joei movement a reality. Takeichi asked the Dioma to make a key trip to the Choshu clan to gain their cooperation, as Ryoma is one of the few people he could trust. However, the party wasn't able to achieve much change in direction among the leadership in Tosa. In Tosa, Samurai were divided between lower and upper class Samurai. Both the Dioma and Takeichi belonged to the lower class, and were prevented from engaging in politics. Tensions between the two classes had been flaring up in recent years, which resulted in the lower classes being more sidelined and discriminated against than ever. In this climate, Ryoma started to find his thinking diverge from Takeichi's. Takeichi saw the only path forward as violence, i.e. progress through assassination. Ryoma, by contrast, put a premium on both individual human life and on human relationships. He began to see success, not in military terms, but in terms of building partnerships and bridges with others. Dioma was possessed with a flexible mind that saw around corners. In his view, it was more important to understand one's opponents and work to find common ground with them than merely beating them into submission. So in March of 1862, Dioma chose the path of Dapan, leaving his clan and becoming a clanless samurai, or donin. It was undoubtedly a tough decision. It was also a decision that changed the course of Japan's history. Ryoma left Tosa with another donin, Sawamure Sonojo, and headed for Choshu. He soon discovered that the political situation was more complicated than he and his friend Takeichi had thought. While some clans, such as Choshu, did indeed support the Sonojoi movement, Others, such as the powerful Satsuma clan, favored a concept called official unification, Koshiki Gattairon, under which the imperial court and the shogunate would merge into a single branch of government. The Son no Joey chose to address dissent by killing the dissenters, leading to outbreaks of violence between the two factions. In a bizarre twist, Ryoma, who had forsworn killing for diplomacy, came under suspicion of assassinating a Tosa politician who had been killed on the orders of Ryoma's friend, Takeichi. Ryoma soon met a man who would have a huge influence on his life. Katsukaishu was a warrior who had become an influential politician in the post-Samurai era. Katsu told in his own letters that he met Ryoma when Ryoma came to kill him. But Katsu was so persuasive in his vision for Japan's future that Ryoma became his pupil instead. Many people feel this is a tall tale of Katsu's, but regardless of the circumstances, Ryoma soon took to studying sailing and numerous other topics under the tutelage of Katsu, a vaunted sailor who had made frequent trips to America. Katsu's love of sailing and his ideas surrounding naval power were a huge influence on Ryoma. Katsu also had deep political connections, including a relationship with the shogun, Tokugawa Iemochi. Katsu introduced Ryoma to other powerful figures, such as Matsudaira Shungaku, the daimyo of the Fukui clan, who saw something special in Ryoma. With the influence of these new connections, Ryoma began to cultivate a vision of a strong, economically thriving Japan defended by a strong navy. In 1864, with the financial support of both Katsu and Matsudaira, he became headmaster of a naval school in Kobe, one of Japan's critical port cities. Around the same time, he met his wife, Narasaki Ryo, commonly called Oryo, at the Terada house in Kyoto. But circumstances soon took a grim turn. Back in Tosa, Takeichi Saizan's Imperial Loyalist Party was decimated by a rival, and Takeichi committed ritualistic suicide in July 1865. In a sorrowful letter to his sister, Ryoma vowed, Nippon no sentaku suru. I'll wash Japan. 
The Oma himself came under suspicion. He had many contacts in the Sonno Joey movement whom he employed strategically. Many of his students were not only supporters of the movement, but were involved in several high-profile attacks on the shogunate and supporters' unification. This didn't go unnoticed by the shogunate, who shut down Ryoma's school. But Ryoma was far from done. Katsukaishu asked the Satsuma clan to help out. Even though its political leanings differed from Ryoma's, Satsuma realized it needed naval expertise, and Ryoma now had that in spades. With funding from Satsuma, Ryoma, all of age 29, started Kameyama Shachu, a private naval shipping and defense firm. It was the first company of its kind in Japan, and even today, some refer to Sakamoto Ryoma as Japan's first CEO. As it turned out, all these seemingly coincidental circumstances, Ryoma leaving Tosa, his friendship with Katsu, his marriage of convenience with the Satsuma clan, put him in a position to change history. The two most powerful clans in Japan, Satsuma and Choshu, were at odds over how to restructure Japanese society to deal with the threat posed by the Western powers. The two clans were effectively at war with each other. When the shogunate moved to crush the Sonno Joey movement, it decided to attack its beating heart, the Choshu clan and it leveraged the forces of Satsuma to do it. Choshu soldiers referred to Satsuma soldiers as the Satsu Pirates. The bad blood between the clans ran deep. But Ryoma, ever the strategist, looked past the clans' differences and found areas where they could cooperate. For Choshu, it was weapons. The shogunate had forbidden them from acquiring sophisticated weapons from the West, which put them at a severe disadvantage against their enemies. And Ryoma knew that Satsuma also faced a dire problem, rice production. Its yields were dropping drastically, and the clan had no way to make up the difference. In other words, each clan had what the other desperately needed. Relying on a fellow Tosa refugee, Nakaoka Shintaro, as a mediator, Ryoma's company worked to secure a treaty. After two failed attempts at the negotiating table, Ryoma showed up personally to the third meeting, and an agreement was secured. The agreement, called the Satsuma Choshu Alliance, the Satcho Dome, not only established trade relations, but secured Satsuma's commitment to back Choshu militarily if it was attacked again by the shogunate. The agreement changed the tide of Japanese history. Thanks both to Satsuma's backing, as well as to the advanced steamships and weapons it received from the Alliance, Choshu was able to defend itself against the Shogun's forces in a renewed battle in 1866, the second Choshu assault, strengthening its own position while severely weakening the Bakufu. With two of the largest clans now allied against the Shogunate, other, smaller clans hesitated to take the Shogun's side. While the Tokugawa government would hold on for another year, its fate had already been settled by a rogue samurai from Tosa. But the Satsuma Choshu alliance made Sakamoto Ryoma a marked man. In March of 1866, Ryoma stayed in the Terada house, where Oryo worked. Accompanying him was a bodyguard, Miyoshi Shinzo, assigned by the Satsuma clan. While taking a bath, Odio heard some 30 men from the shogun-controlled magistrate's office surround the building. She quickly warned Uduoma and Miyoshi, who were able to muster their defenses before the guards stormed in. The men attempted to seize or kill Uduoma, who used a pistol to shoot two of them dead, while Miyoshi fended off the rest with a spear. But Uduoma's hand was badly injured and he was bleeding profusely. Miyoshi led Uduoma out of the building and tried to get him to the Satsuma residence in Kyoto but couldn't find his way in the dead of night. The two hid in a wooden shed until morning. Miyoshi was prepared to take his own life through seppuku, but Ryoma persuaded him to leave him behind and seek out help from Satsuma's forces himself. Eventually, Miyoshi made it to the Satsuma residence, and Satsuma forces retrieved a barely conscious Ryoma. On the advice of his physician and the order of the head of the Satsuma military, Saigo Takamori, Ryoma and Oryo took a 92-day respite in Kagoshima. It was perhaps the first time in years that the ambitious samurai was able to take a vacation. After recuperating, though, Ryoma didn't slow down. 
Besides tending to his shipping business, he became a critical figure in the discussions around the restoration of power to the emperor, the Taisei Hokan. The leaders of Satsuma and Choshu were keen on bringing down the shogunate through armed conflict. Ryoma, however, together with Tosa politician Kogo Shojiro, worked to convince all parties to allow for a peaceful transition of power. Ryoma's arguments won the day, and on October 13th, the leaders of 40 clans made a joint announcement that conformed in the main to Ryoma's thinking. It was the last great act of his short life. On November 11th, Ryoma and Nakaota Shintaro were ambushed in Omiya in Kyoto by an assailant. Sick and separated from his sword, Ryoma was unable to defend himself. He died at age 31. His friend Nakaoka hung on long enough to give testimony about their assailants, but died a couple of days later. Ryoma's assailant was never identified or captured. To this day, his murder remains an unsolved mystery. There are four predominant theories. 1. Kogo Shojiro, who killed Ryoma in an attempt to take full credit for the restoration's success. 2. The Satsuma clan, who feared what would happen if they didn't remove the Bakfu by force, took Ryoma out to undermine the peaceful transition of power. 3. The Kishu clan, with whom Ryoma had a bitter legal dispute over a sunken ship. And 4. The Shogunate, for whom Ryoma had become public enemy number one. Whoever killed Ryoma, however, couldn't stop the course of events. The restoration occurred. Former samurai such as Katsukaishu transitioned from swordsmen to statesmen, and Japan began building up its industry and its military. Japan was on the path to modernization, and it owed a huge debt to Ryoma for bringing it there. Today, Ryoma's story is often retold in products such as the manga Oi Ryoma and the NHK drama Ryoma Den. It's no exaggeration to call Sakamoto Ryoma one of the lasting heroes, not just of the Meiji Restoration, but of Japanese history. On his sprawling tribute to Ryoma's life, online author Harada sums up a number of reasons for Ryoma's popularity. A decisive leader who was prepared to go to war if he had to, Ryoma also possessed a compassion and a breadth of thinking that was exceptional for his time. When others reflexively reached for violent solutions to the problems of the day, Ryoma sought first to negotiate peaceful strategies that included all parties. The restoration of the emperor put Japan on the path to empire, resulting in a host of tragedies, including the occupation of Korea, the invasion of China, and World War II. Many in Japan have asked themselves, if Ryoma had lived, how might things have been different? We'll never know. What's certain is that post-Samurai Japan suffered from the loss of his keen, large-hearted intellect. <laughs>